I think you're really going to like this. I've been doing science and engineering projects for decades. And even just for this channel, over the last decade, we've done over 100 science, engineering, and technology videos. And I have to say, the phenomenon I'm going to show you today may be the most surprising or impressive of any that I've ever seen. Now, we're not building rocket engines, we're not detonating hydrogen, I'm not taking drones out of the sky with lasers. This effect is at the atomic level. It's very, very tiny. But its implications could be very large. Now, a few weeks ago, I was watching a podcast where they made reference to a science news article about a group that had developed a method for generating electricity directly from water, specifically rainwater, at over 10% efficiency. I was intrigued enough about it that I decided to check out the article. If you're unfamiliar with science news, it's sort of a lightweight periodical that does updates on current trends in technology, science, physics, and it's a good publication, you might find it very interesting, but it's also, by its very nature, a summary of these different projects. And so I decided to take a look at the source paper. This paper was published by a group out of Singapore. And if you're interested, it's a very well-written article, it's very interesting, and so I'm going to put a link in the description below the video to this article if you want to dig deeper than we're going to dig right here today. In order to understand what's going on, we have to cover some of the fundamental principles about the water that's involved. When you have water, whether it's in the Pacific Ocean or in a beaker like this one, almost all of the water exists as molecular H2O. But about one part per billion is present as ions, a positive hydronium H plus ion, and a negative OH minus hydroxide ion. These probably form due to thermal vibrations, but because they almost instantly recombine and neutralize, there's no net charge separation. The bulk of the water remains neutral. If you are operating near a surface, and I'm talking atomically near a surface, the rate of ionization goes up a lot more than a hundredfold. And if the surface has a very high surface energy, like many plastics, especially fluorinated plastics like Teflon or fluorinated polyethylene, that ratio can go up a thousandfold. But nevertheless, because the ions can recombine almost instantly, again, there's no net charge separation. The bulk of the water is neutral. If the water is flowing over the surface, during that interval, that the ions form, there is a very, very small chance that they will move far enough apart that they can't recombine. And the surface tends to have a greater affinity for the OH minus, the hydroxide ion, than the H plus, hyd hydronium ion, that remains in the liquid. Nevertheless, I'm sure you realize that ions are promiscuous. And so that H plus ion that's moving away from its old partner will eventually encounter another hydroxide ion. And the hydroxide ion that it left behind will eventually have a hydronium pass by. They can recombine, no net charge separation. The bulk of the water, again, remains neutral. Where the magic occurs is when you have intermittent flow. If you take, with the syringe, and you drop some water on this surface, you can see how it beads up and then pours into this beaker. What happens is if an ionization occurs at the trailing end of one of these droplets, the hydronium moves away, but there's no hydronium to recombine with the hydroxide that it left behind. As a result, those droplets become positively charged. And if they pour into a beaker like this one, the whole beaker contains positive charges. Now we have net charge separation. Now you might say, well, yeah, okay, maybe. But what about all those hydroxide ions that are left behind on the surface? Eventually the process would stop. It doesn't. Plastic is an excellent electrical insulator, but wet plastic not so much.
And so those hydroxide ions that are adherent to the surface can move around. They can even move back upstream toward the source of the water, like this stainless steel hydro hypodermic needle. If you connect an electrode to this needle, you now have a complete circuit. You're actually generating electricity. This is somewhat analogous to what happens in the winter when you scuff your woolen socks across a carpet. As you do so, you scrape electrons off of the carpet and your entire body becomes negatively charged. When you approach a ground, let's say a wall plate or a door handle, those electrons can flow out in a painful spark. It's not exactly the same process, but it has one other similarity. The current generated here is extremely low. But the voltage is very high. It's around 6,000 volts. So we are making substantial power. Now, I could hook this system up to a meter, and you could take a look at the numbers that are being produced in terms of current and voltage. But less expensive, simpler, and I think more impressive is to use this power to light a lamp. Now, because of the low current and the high voltage, driving an LED or an incandescent light, it's not practical unless we use some sort of conversion circuit. We can directly drive, however, neon indicator lights. If you're not familiar with these, these tiny little glass beads contain a low pressure of neon gas and two electrodes inside of the glass bulb. When you apply a voltage of about 100 volts, either AC or DC, doesn't matter, these things will begin to glow orange. And they're called indicator lights because they're often put on the front of uh, power supplies and meters to show that something's operating or you're op you've turned on a certain switch. Nevertheless, because these things can operate with as little as 100 volts, I could theoretically drive as many as 60 of these things in series. And so what I built is a little assembly here where I soldered 28 of these neon lamps in series on this board. I could have done 60, I just got tired of soldering. What I'm going to do is show you that this actually works before I get into the equipment necessary in order to be able to produce this. So let me hook up my little electrode into a beaker that is going to capture the H plus ions. I've already got the other electrode hooked up to the needle here, and I'm going to turn on some water flow. Good. Now, because it's so bright in here with all the studio lighting, it's going to be difficult to see this, so I've built a little light box, and I'm going to place this inside here, and then the camera will demonstrate. You can see them glowing right here. And if I adjust this a little bit, maybe I can get a little bit more brightness out of it. Not too bad. Now, some of you may think we're cheating and we got a battery or something in here in order to make this light. We aren't. This is actually making these lamps glow. If I interrupt the flow, See? Keep trying to rearrange this. Not bad. You see the flashing light? Pretty cool. And this really impressed the heck out of me because this is just pure water and it's producing this light like this. Now, the setup is extremely simple. What we have here is some distilled water in a container that goes through this tubing and this on-off valve. And the only reason for this one meter height or so is to generate a little bit of pressure to drive the water out of the needle. It's not associated with the a voltage or the power that's being produced. It's just simply a source for the water. All of the energy is being calculated as being generated from the potential drop through this tubing. <laughs> I love this. 
Now, the researchers called the kind of flow that you want, the intermittent flow, plug flow, as if you have these little sausages separated by spaces or air spaces, as you can see traveling down the tube. The dimensions of this tubing are pretty critical. If it turns out that you use a very, very small amount of uh, a very, very uh, narrow diameter tube, say a one millimeter ID tube, the water will just simply overflow and it will run down as a continuous flow of water and we won't get any power. If you go to a six millimeter ID tubing, then what happens is the water will go inside the tube, but it runs down in continuous rivulets. Again, no power. You need intermittent flow. They discovered that a two millimeter ID tubing was optimal. I don't know how many different diameters they checked. I checked a bunch and I found that a three millimeter ID tubing is the optimal diameter. In addition, length matters. The longer the tube gets, the higher the potential that we generate up to about 30 centimeters or one foot. Beyond that point, it doesn't do any damage, but there's no gain. You don't gain additional voltage. Any shorter and the potential goes down and the lights are not able to be lit as, as brightly or as many lights. The other thing to sort of keep in mind here is what we have the tubing hooked up to is the back of one of these syringes where I sliced it off so we could jam it in the tube. And then we have an 18 gauge stainless steel blunt end needle, not the kind you'd want to get an injection with, it would hurt. That is then placed about two centimeters away from the opening to the tube. And then they did something very clever. They took the tube and they split it longitudinally about two centimeters from its end and then cut the front end of that hemi-cylinder off. So the back wall of the tubing gathers the water, but all of the turbulence and the swirling allows air to be entrained into the system to allow it to flow down and mix so that we get this intermittent plug type of flow. <laughs> and just to show you, if I stop it, start it, stop it, start it, it works. Now, there's been a lot of criticism of this paper in the science media recently. And I think it was self-inflicted. One good example is a podcaster or a uh, YouTube creator that I follow very frequently. It's uh, Zabine Hassenfelder. And she's a ex-particle physicist that covers science, engineering, technology, and a lot of fundamental physics, and did a review of this system, and was very critical of the author's claim that this could be used to generate electricity from rainwater. Her analysis is 100% spot on. I agree with it. And if you like this kind of technology, take a look at her channel. It's actually an excellent channel. She tends to be a little bit of a curmudgeon, but she's got a good sense of humor. Nevertheless, in her defense, the criticism was self-inflicted because the authors claim that you could generate power from rainwater. The problem is that rain is too diffuse. It's too spread out. To try to gather enough water into an area in order to be able to generate power you'd have to spend so much money on the equipment and the setup in order to be able to do that, you'd never get payback in terms of the amount of power generated. Nevertheless, this type of system has a lot of potential because number one, if we ignore the power for just a second, the high potential that's being created here can have a very significant effect in chemical synthesis. This water down here is quite positively charged. It's actually acidic even though we've not added any kind of ionized acid like hydrochloric or nitric acid to it, this is acidic. So if you're making dyes or chemicals, intermittent flow of this water could affect the synthesis process. In the case of pharmaceuticals, where you have proteins or large carbohydrates, they can change their configuration due to these charge separations, and that also could affect the synthesis. But if you really want to stick with power, how to make power, then what I would say is forget the rain. Consider the fact that this can generate power with a water flow on the order of centimeters per second, 
far lower than any other method that you could use to generate power. As a consequence, why not use water that's flowing in a slow moving stream? Gray water, tidal water. What about the effluent from a dam? That water is already well aerated. Most of the energy has been removed by the turbines and you have a relatively slow movement of water. In addition, you also have the infrastructure to gather the water and to, to gather the power and to distribute it. So you don't have an, a lot of additional cost. It's sort of a cogeneration system. In that kind of a system, you're not going to want to run with one of these tubes that's generating maybe a milliwatt of power. You'd want to use an apparatus that allows you to operate thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of channels at the same time. With 3D printing and lithography, you could print up modular item devices that allowed you to operate in parallel with many, many channels. You could even coat them with the metal and introduce the introduction system so that everything is in one hard preformed item, which would be kind of cool. In addition, one of the things that might be interesting to consider is the fact that the water is going down, straight down the tube, but it doesn't have to. It could take a circuitous route down into the beaker. It would still work as long as you have intermittent plug flow inside of your tubing. It could even take a loop and move down as long as the flow is intermittent, which suggests what about the possibility of using open cell foam coating it with metal, millions of individual channels, a cost that's almost free and may allow you to build something like this extremely inexpensively and therefore profitably. Now the system here is so simple that you could actually do this at home. You probably have half the stuff you need already laying around. And the few things that you would need, maybe the syringe, maybe the needle, possibly the FEP or fluorinated polyethylene tubing, which is not that exotic, but it's a, not the standard stuff you'd get for your humidifier or your, your ice maker. Nevertheless, it's very inexpensive. And so you could set up something like I did right here and impress your friends and family with what you're doing. I suspect that the researchers are in fact looking into these um, parallel operations in order to get much more power out of these devices. But if they don't, we will. So stay tuned and we'll give you updates as we progress with this development. And if you like this kind of project, you like these kinds of relatively simple physics demonstrations, please do us a favor and subscribe because it really helps out the channel by exposing our videos to a much broader audience. And the bigger we get, the more we can afford to do and the more frequently we can afford to do it. And if you really like what we do, take a look at the Patreon page and the uh, Patreon supporters, because not only do they help us out substantially in terms of financially, but we also release some of our videos a little ahead of time and some special videos that we don't put on YouTube. So. I want to thank you very much for watching. I'm not going to tell you to stay safe because there's not a lot of danger here, but have fun and we'll see you soon.